from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. School for the Unspeakable by Manly Wade Wellman Bart Setwick dropped off the train at Carrington and stood for a moment on the station platform. An honest face, walnut lad in tweeds. This little town and its famous school would be his home for the next eight months. But which way to the school? The sun had set, and he could barely see the shop signs across Carrington's modest main street. He hesitated, and a soft voice spoke at his elbow. Are you for the school? Startled, Bart Setwick wheeled. In the gray twilight stood another youth, smiling thinly and waiting, as if for an answer. The stranger was all of nineteen years old. That meant maturity to young Setwick, who was fifteen, and his pale face had shrewd lines to it. His tall, shambling body was clad in high-necked jersey and unfashionably tight trousers. Bart Setwick skimmed him with a quick, appraising eye of young America. "'I just got here,' replied my name's Setwick. "'Mine's Hogue.' Out came a slender hand. Setwick took it and found it froggy cold with a suggestion of steel wire muscles. Glad to meet you. I came down on the chance someone would drop off the train. Let me give you a lift to the school. Hogue turned away, felinely light for all his ungainliness, and led his new acquaintance around the corner of the little wooden railway station. Behind the structure, half hidden in its shadow, stood a shabby buggy with a lean bay horse in the shafts. Get in, invited Hogue, but Bart Setwick paused for a moment. His generation was not used to such vehicles. Hogue chuckled and said, Oh, this is only a school wrinkle. We run to funny customs. Get in. Setwick obeyed. How about my trunk? Leave it. The taller youth swung himself in beside Setwick and took the reins. You'll not need it tonight. He snapped his tongue and the bay horse stirred, drew them around and off down a bush-lined side road. Its hoofbeats were oddly muffled. They turned a corner another and came into open country. The lights of Carrington, newly kindled against the night, hung behind like a constellation settled down to earth. Setwick felt a hint of chill that did not seem to fit the September evening. How far is the school from town? he asked. Four or five miles, Hogue replied in his hushed voice. That was deliberate on the part of the founders. They wanted to make it hard for the students to get to town for larks. It forced us to dig up our own amusements. The pale face creased in a faint smile as if this were pleasantry. There's just a few of the right sort on hand tonight. By the way, what did you get sent out for? Setwick frowned his mystification. Why, to go to school. Dad sent me. But what for? Don't you know that this is a high-class prison prep? Half of us are lunkheads that need poking along. The other half are fellows who got in scandals somewhere else. Like me, again Hogue smiled. Setwick began to dislike his companion. They rolled a mile or so in silence before Hogue again asked a question. Do you go to church, Setwick? The new boy was afraid to appear priggish and made a careless show with, not very often. Can you recite anything from the Bible? Hogue's voice took on an anxious tinge. Not that I know of. Good, was the most hearty response. As I was saying, there's only a few of us at the school tonight. Only three, to be exact. And we don't like Bible quoters. Setwick laughed, trying to appear sage and cynical. Isn't Satan reputed to quote the Bible to his own? What do you know about Satan? interrupted Hogue. He turned full on Setwick, studying him with intent, dark eyes. Then, as if answering his own question. Little enough, I'll bet. Would you like to know about him? Sure I would, replied Sedwick, wondering what the joke would be. I'll teach you after a while, Hogue promised cryptically, and silence fell again. Half a moon was well up as they came in sight of a dark jumble of buildings. 
Here we are, announced Hogue, and then throwing back his head, he emitted a wild, wordless howl that made Sedwick almost jump out of the buggy. That's to let the others know we're coming, he explained. Listen. Back came a seeming echo of the howl, shrill, faint, and eerie. The horse wavered in its muffled trot, and Hogue clucked it back into step. They turned in at a driveway well grown up in weeds, and two minutes more brought them up to the rear of the closest building. It was dim gray in the wash of moonbeams, with blank, inky rectangles for windows. Nowhere was there light, but as the buggy came to a halt, Setwick saw a young head pop out of a window on the lower floor. "'Here already, Ho?' came a high, reedy voice. "'Yes,' answered the youth at the reins, "'and I've brought a new man with me.' Thrilling a bit to hear himself called the man, Setwick collided. His name's Setwick, went on Hogue. Meet Andolph Setwick, a great friend of mine. Andolph flourished a hand in greeting and scrambled out over the window sill. He was chubby and squat and even paler than Hogue, with a low forehead beneath lank, wet-looking hair and black eyes set, wide apart in a fat, stupid-looking face. His shabby jacket was too tight for him, and beneath worn knickers his legs and feet were bare. He might have been an overgrown thirteen or an undeveloped eighteen. Felcher ought to be along in half a second, he volunteered. Entertain Setwick while I put up the buggy, Hogue directed him. Andoff nodded, and Hogue gathered the lines in his hands, but paused for a final word. No funny business yet, Andoff, he cautioned seriously. Setwick, don't let this lard bladder rag you or tell you wild stories until I come back. Andoff laughed shrilly. No, no wild stories, he promised. You'll do the talking, Hogue. The buggy trundled away and Andolph swung his fat, grinning face to the new arrival. Here comes Fletcher, he announced. Felcher, meet Setwick. Another boy had bobbed up, it seemed from nowhere. Setwick had not seen him come around the corner of the building or slip out of a door window. He was probably as old as Hogue or older, but so small as to be almost a dwarf and frail to boot. His most noticeable characteristic was his hairiness. A great mop covered his head, pushed over his neck and ears, and hung unkemptly to his bright, deep-set eyes. His lips and cheeks were spread with a rank down and a curly thatch peeped through the unbuttoned collar of his soiled white shirt. The hand he offered Setwick was almost simian in its shagginess and in the hardness of its palm. Too, it was cold and damp. Setwick remembered the same thing of Hogue's hand clasp. We're the only ones here so far, Felcher remarked, his voice surprisingly deep and strong, for so small a creature rang like a great bell. Isn't even the headmaster here? inquired Sedwick, and at that the other two began to laugh uproariously, Andolph's five squeal rendering an obligato to Felcher's bell boom, Hogue returning asked what the fun was. Setwick asks, groaned Felcher, why the headmaster isn't here to welcome him. More fife laughter and bell laughter. I doubt if Setwick would think the answer was funny, Hogue commented and then chuckled softly himself. Setwick, who had been well brought up, began to grow nettled. Tell me about it, he urged, in what he hoped was a bleak tone, and I'll join your chorus of mirth. Felcher and Andolph gazed at him with eyes strangely eager and yearning. Then they faced Hogue. Let's tell him, they both said at once. But Hogue shook his head. Not yet. One thing at a time. Let's have the song first. They began to sing. The first verse of their offering was obscene, with no pretense of humor to redeem it. Setwick had never been squeamish, but he found himself definitely repelled. The second verse seemed less objectionable, but it hardly made sense. All they tried to teach here now goes untaught. Ready, steady, each here, knowledge we sought. What they call disaster killed us not, O Master. Rule us, we beseech thee, I hand and thought. It was something like a hymn, Setwick decided, but before what altar would such hymns be sung? Hogue must have read that question in his mind. You mentioned Satan in the buggy on the way out, he recalled, his knowing face hanging like a mask in the half-dimness close to Setwick. Well, that was a Satanist song. It was? Who made it? I did, Hogue informed him. 
How do you like it? Setwick made no answer. He tried to sense mockery in Hogue's voice, but could not find it. What, he asked finally, does all this Satanist singing have to do with the headmaster? A lot, came back Felcher deeply. And a lot, squealed Andolph. Hogue gazed from one of his friends to the others, and for the first time he smiled broadly. It gave him a toothy look. I believe, he ventured quietly, but weightily, that we might as well let Setwick in on the secret of our little circle. Here it would begin. The new boy decided. The school hazing of which he had heard and read so much. He had anticipated such things with something of excitement, even eagerness, but now he wanted none of them. He did not like his three companions, and he did not like the way they approached whatever it was they intended to do. He moved backward a pace or two, as if to retreat. Swift as darting birds, Hogue and Andolph closed in at either elbow. Their chill hands clutched him, and suddenly he felt light-headed and sick. Things that had been clear in the moonlight went hazy and distorted. "'Come on and sit down, Setwick,' invited Hogue, as though from a great distance. His voice did not grow loud or harsh, but it embodied real menace. "'Sit on that window sill, or would you like us to carry you?' At the moment, Setwick wanted only to be free of their touch, and so he walked unresistingly to the sill and scrambled up on it. Behind him was the blackness of an unknown chamber, and at his knees gathered the three who seemed so eager to tell him their private joke. The headmaster was a proper churchgoer, began Hogue as though he were the spokesman for the group. He didn't have any use for devils or devil worship. Went on record against them when he addressed us in chapel. That was what started us. Right, nodded Andolph turning up his fat, larval face. Anything he outlawed, we wanted to do. Isn't that logic? Logic and reason, wound up Felcher. His hairy right hand twiddled on the sill near Setwick's thigh. In the moonlight, it looked like a big, nervous spider. Hug resumed. I don't know of any prohibition of his. It was easier or more fun to break. Setwick found that his mouth had gone dry. His tongue could barely moisten his lips. You mean, he said, that you began to worship devils? Ho oh, nodded happily, like a teacher at an apt pupil. One vacation I got a book on the cult. The three of us studied it, then began ceremonies. We learned the charms and spells, forward and backward. They're twice as good backward, put in Felcher, and Andolph giggled. Have you any idea, Setwick, Hogue almost cooed, what it was that appeared in our study the first time we burned wine and sulfur with the proper words spoken over them? Setwick did not want to know. He clenched his teeth. If you're trying to scare me, he managed to growl out, it certainly isn't going to work. All three laughed once more and began to chatter out the protestation of good faith. I swear that we're telling the truth, Setwick, Hogue assured him. Do you want to hear it or don't you? Setwick had very little choice in the matter, and he realized it. Oh, go ahead, he capitulated, wondering how it would do to crawl backward from the sill into the darkness of the room. Hogue leaned toward them with the air as of one confiding. The headmaster caught us, caught us red-handed. Book open, fire burning, chanted Felcher. He had something very fine to say about the vengeance of heaven, Hogue went on. We got to laughing at him. He worked up a frenzy. Finally, he tried to take heaven's vengeance into his own hands. Tried to visit it on us in a very primitive way, but it didn't work. Nobody could kill us, Felcher added. Not after the oath we've taken and the promises that have been made us. What promises, demanded Setwick, who was struggling hard not to believe. Who made you any promises? Those we worship, Felcher told him. If he was simulating earnestness, it was a supreme bit of acting. Setwick, realizing this, was more daunted than he cared to show. When did all these things happen, was his next question. When, echoed Hook. Oh, years and years ago. Years and years ago, repeated Andolph. 
long before you were born, Vulture assured him. They were standing close together, their backs to the moon that shone in Setwick's face. He could not see their expressions clearly, but their three voices, Hogue's soft, Vulture's deep and vibrant, Andolph's high and squeaky, were absolutely serious. I know what you're arguing within yourself, Hogue announced somewhat smugly. How can we who talk about those many past years seem so young? That calls for an explanation, I'll admit. He paused as if choosing words. Time for us stand still. It came to a halt on that very night, Setwick, the night our headmaster tried to put an end to our worship. And to us, smirked the gross-bodied Antoff with his air of self-congratulation at capping one of Hogue's statements. The worship goes on, pronounced Belcher, in the same chanting manner that he had affected once before. The worship goes on, and we go on too. Which brings us to the point, Hogue came in briskly. Do you want to throw in with us, Setwick? Make the fourth of this lively little party? No, I don't, snapped Setwick vehemently. They fell silent and gave back a little. A trio of bizarre silhouettes against the pale moon glow. Setwick could see the flash of their staring eyes among the shadows of their faces. He knew that he was afraid but hid his fear. Pluckily he dropped from the sill to the ground. Dew from the grass spattered his sock-clad ankles between Oxford's and trouser cuffs. I guess it's my turn to talk, he told them levelly. I'll make it short. I don't like you, nor anything you've said, and I'm getting out of here. We won't let you, said Hogue, hushed but emphatic. We won't let you, murmured Andolph and Felcher together, as though they had rehearsed it a thousand times. Sedwick clenched his fist. His father had taught him to box. He took a quick, smooth stride towards Hogue and hit him hard in the face. Next moment, all three had flung themselves upon him. They did not seem to strike or grapple or tug, but he went down under their assault. The shoulders of his tweed coat wallowed in sand and he smelled crushed weeds. Hogue on top of him pinned in his arms with a knee on each bicep. Felcher and Andolph were stooping close. Glaring up in helpless rage, Setwick knew once and for all that this was no schoolboy prank. Never did practical jokers gather round their victim with such staring, green-gleaming eyes, such drawn jowls, such quivering lips. Hogue bared white fangs, his pointed tongue quested once over them. Knife, he muttered, and Felcher fumbled in a pocket, then passed him something that sparkled in the moonlight. Hogue's lean hand reached for it, then whipped back. Hogue had lifted his eyes to something beyond the huddle. He choked and whimpered inarticulately, sprang up from Setwick's laboring chest, and fell back in awkward haste. The others followed his shocked stare, then a suddenly cowered and retreated in turn. It's the master, wailed Andolph. Yes, roared a gruff new voice. You're old headmaster, and I've come back to master you. Rising upon one elbow, the prostrate Setwick saw what they had seen. A tall, thick-bodied figure in a long, dark coat, topped with a square, distorted face and a tousle of white locks. Its eyes glittered with their own pale, hard light. As it advanced slowly and heavily, it emitted a snigger of murderous joy. Even at first glance, Setwick was aware that it cast no shadow. I am in time, mouthed the newcomer. You were going to kill this poor boy? Hogue had recovered and made a stand. Kill him? He quavered, seeming to fawn before the threatening presence. No, we'd have given him life. You call it life? Trumpeted the long-coated one. You'd have sucked out his blood to team your own dead veins. Damn him to your filthy condition. But I'm here to prevent you. A finger pointed huge and knuckly, and then came a torrent of language. To the nerve stunned Setwick, it sounded like a bit from the New Testament or perhaps from the Book of Common Prayer. All at once he remembered Hogue's avowed dislike for such quotations. His three erstwhile assailants reeled as if before a high wind that chilled or scorched. No, no, don't, they begged wretchedly. The square, old face gaped open and spewed merciless laughter. The knuckly finger traced a cross in the air, and the trio wailed in chorus, 
as though the sign had been drawn upon their flesh with a tongue of flame. Hogg dropped his knees. Don't, he sobbed. I have power, mocked the tormentor. During years shut up, I want it, and now I'll use it. Again a triumphant burst of mirth. I know you're damned and can't be killed, but you can be tortured. I'll make you crawl like worms before I'm done with you. Setwick gained his shaky feet. The long coat and the blocky head leaned toward him. Run, you, did a rough roar in his ears. Get out of here and thank God for the chance. Setwick ran, staggering. He blundered through the weeds of the driveway, gained the road beyond. In the distance gleamed the lights of Carrington. As he turned his face toward them and quickened his pace, he began to weep, chokingly, hysterically, exhaustingly. He did not stop running until he reached the platform in front of the station. A clock across the street struck ten, in a deep voice not unlike Fletcher's. Setwick breathed deeply, fished out his handkerchief, and mopped his face. His hand was quivering like a grass stalk in a breeze. Beg pardon, came a cheery hail. You must be Setwick. At once before, on this same platform, he whirled around with startled speed. Within touch of him stood a broad-shouldered man of thirty or so with horn-rimmed spectacles. He wore neat Norfolk jacket and flannels, a short briar pipe, was clamped in a good-humored mouth. I'm Collins, one of the masters at the school, he introduced himself. If you're set, we, you've had us worried. We expected you on that seven o'clock train, you know. I dropped down to see if I w couldn't trace you. Setwick found a little of his lost wind. But I've been to the school, he mumbled protestingly. His hands still trembled, gestured vaguely along the way he had come. Collins threw back his head and laughed and apologized. Sorry, said it's no joke if you really had all that walk for nothing. Why, that old place is deserted. Used to be a catch-off for incorrigible rich boys. They closed it about fifty years ago when the headmaster went mad and killed three of his pupils. As a matter of coincidence, the master himself died just this afternoon in the state hospital for the insane. The Hairy Ones Shall Dance by Gans T. Field Forward to whom it may concern. Few words are best, as Sir Philip Sidney once wrote in Challenging an Enemy. The present account will be accepted as a challenge by the vast army of skeptics of which I once made one. Therefore I write it brief and bald. If my story seems unsteady in spots, that is because the hand that writes it still quivers from my recent ordeal. Shifting the metaphor from duello to military engagement, this is but the first gun of the bombardment. Even now, sworn statements are being prepared by all others who survived the strange and, in some degree, unthinkable adventure I am recounting. After that, every great psychic investigator in the country, as well as some from Europe, will begin researches. I wish that my friends and brother magicians, Houdini and Thurston, had lived to bear a hand in them. I must apologize for the strong admixture of the personal element in my narrative. Some may feel that I err against good taste. My humble argument is that I was not merely an observer, but an actor, albeit a clumsy one, throughout the drama. As to the setting forth of matters, which many will call impossible, let me smile in advance. Things happen and have always happened that defy the narrow science of test tube and formula. I can only say again that I am writing the truth and that my statement will be supported by my companions in the adventure. Signed Talbot Wills, November 15, 1937. You don't believe in psychic phenomena, said Dr. Otto Zoberg yet again, because you won't. This, with studied kindness, sitting in the most comfortable chair of my hotel room, I at thirty-four silently hoped I would have his health and charm at fifty-four. He was so rugged for all his lean length, so well-groomed for all his tweeds and beard and joined eyebrows, so articulate for all his accent. Dr. Zoberg quite apparently liked and admired me, and I felt guilty once more that I did not entirely return the compliment. 
I know that you are a stage magician, he began afresh. I was once, I amended a little sulkily. My early career had brought me considerable money and notice, but after the novelty of show business was worn off, I had never rejoiced in it. Talboto the Mysterious, it had been impressive, but tawdry. Better to be Talbot Wills, lecturer and investigator in the field of exposing fraudulent mediums. For six years I had known Dr. Otto Zilberg, the champion of spiritism and mediumism, as rival and companion. We had first met in debate under auspices of the Society for Psychic Research in London. I, young enough for enthusiasm but also for carelessness, had been badly outthought and outtalked. But afterward, Dr. Zoberg had praised my arguments and my delivery and had graciously taken me out to a late supper. The following day, there arrived from him a present of helpful books and magazines. Our next platform duel found me in a position to get a little of my own back and he afterward laughingly congratulated me on turning to account the material he had sent me. After that, we were public foemen and personal inseparables. Just now, we were touring the United States, debating, giving exhibitions, visiting mediums. The night's program before Washington audience liberally laced with high officials had ended in what we agreed was a draw, and here we were squabbling good-naturedly afterward. Please, doctor, I begged, offering him a cigarette. Save your charges of stubbornness for the theater. He waved my case aside and bit the end from a villainous black cheroot. I wouldn't say it here or in public if it weren't true, Talbot. Yet you sneer even at telepathy and only half believe in mental suggestion. Ach, you are worse than Houdini. Houdini was absolutely sincere, I almost blazed for I had known and worshipped that brilliant and kindly prince of conjurers and fraud finders. Ah, to be sure, to be sure, not as Zoberg over his blazing match. I did not say he was not, yet he refused proof, the proof that he himself embodied. Houdini was a great mystic, a medium, his power for miracles he did not know himself. I had heard that before from Conan Doyle as well as Zoberg, but I made no comment. Zoberg continued. Perhaps Houdini was afraid. If anything could frighten so brave and wise a man, it would assuredly come from within. And so he would not even listen to argument. He turned suddenly somber. Perhaps he knew best, Shah, but he was stubborn and so are you. I don't think you can say that of me, I objected once more. The cheroot was alight now and I kindled a cigarette to combat, in some degree, the gunpowdery fumes. Teeth gleamed amiably through the beard, and Zoberg nodded again, in frank delight this time. Oh, we have hopes of you, Wills, where we gave up Houdini. He had never said that before, not so plainly at any rate. I smiled back. I've always been willing to be shown. Give me a full proof, fake proof, supernormal phenomenon, doctor. Let me convince myself. Then I'll come gladly into the spiritist camp. Ah. So you always say, he exploded, but without genuine wrath. Why must the burden of proof rest with the spirits? How can you prove that they do not live and move and act? Studies have offered a prize of $5,000 to any medium whose spirit miracles I could not duplicate by honest sleight of hand. He gestured with slim fingers, as though to push the words back into me. That proves absolutely nothing, Wills. For all your skill, do you think that sleight of hand can be the only way? Is it even the best way? I've unmasked famous mediums for years at the rate of one a month, I flung back. Unmasked them as the clumsiest of fakes. Because some are dishonest. Are all dishonest, he appealed. What specific thing would convince you, my friend? I thought for a moment, gazing at him through the billows of smoke. Not a gray hair to him, and I, twenty years his junior, had six or eight at either temple. I went on to admire, and even to envy, that pointed trowel of beard, the sort of thing that I, a magician, might have cultivated once. Then I made my answer. I had asked for a materialization, doctor, an ectoplasmic apparition, visible and solid to touch, in an empty room with no curtains or closets, all entrances sealed by myself, the medium and witnesses shackled. He started to open his mouth, but I hurried to prevent him. I know what you'll say, that I've seen a number of impressive ectoplasms. So I have, perhaps, 
but not one scientifically and dispassionately controlled. No, doctor. If I am to be convinced, I must make the conditions and set the stage myself. And if the materialization was a complete success, then it will prove the claim to me, to the world. Materializations are the most important question in the whole field. He looked long at me, narrowing his shrewd eyes beneath the dark single bar of his brow. Wills, he said at length, I hope you would ask something like this. You did? Ja, because first can you spare a day or so? I replied guardedly, I can, I believe. We have two weeks or more before the New Orleans date. I computed rapidly. Yes, that's December 8th. What have you got up your sleeve, doctor? He grinned once more with a great display of gleaming white teeth and flung out his long arms. My sleeves, you will observe, are empty, he cried. No trickery, but within five hours of where we sit, five hours by fast automobile, is a little town, and in that town there is a little medium. No wills you have never seen or heard of her. It is only myself who found her by chance, who studied her long and prayerfully. Come with me, Wills. She will teach you how little you know and how much you can learn. I have sat down with the purpose of writing out, plainly and even flatly, all that happened to me and to Dr. Otto Zoberg in our impromptu adventure at Psychic Investigations. Yet almost at the start I find it necessary to be vague about the tiny town where that adventure ran its course. Zoborg began by refusing to tell me its name, and now my friends of various psychical research committees have asked me to hold my peace until they have finished certain examinations without benefit of yellow journals or prying politicians. It is located, as Zoborg told me, within five miles by fast automobile of Washington. On the following morning, after a quick and early breakfast, we departed at seven o'clock in my sturdy coupe. I drove and Zoborg guided. In the turtle back we had stowed bags for the November sky had begun to boil up with dark heavy clouds and a storm might delay us. On the way Zoborg talked a great deal. With his usual charm and animation, he scoffed at my skepticism and prophesied my conversion before another midnight. A hundred years ago, realists like yourself were ridiculing hypnotism, he chuckled. They thought that it was a fantastic fake, like one of Edgar Poe's amusing tales, ja? And now it is a great science for healing and comforting the world. A few years ago, the world scorned mental telepathy. Hold on, I interrupted. I'm none too convinced of it now. I said just that last night. However, you think that there is some grain of truth to it. You'd be a fool to laugh at the many experiments in clairvoyance carried on at Duke University. Yes, they are impressive, I admitted. They are tremendous and by no means unique, he insisted. Think of a number between one and ten, he said suddenly. I gazed at my hands on the wheel, thought of a joking reply, then fell in with his mood. All right, I replied. I'm thinking of a number. What is it? It is seven, he cried out at once, then laughed heartily at the blank look on my face. Look here. That's a logical number for an average man to think of, I protested. You relied on human nature, not telepathy. He grinned and tweaked the end of his beard between manicured fingers. Very good, Wills. Try again. A color this time. I paused a moment before replying. All right, guess what it is. He too hesitated, staring at me sidewise. I think it is blue, he offered at length. Go to the head of the class, I grumbled. I'd rather expected you to guess red. That's most obvious. But I was not guessing, he assured me. A flash of blue came before my mind's eye. Come, let us try another time. We continued the experiment for a while. Zoberg was not always correct, but he was surprisingly close in nearly every case. The most interesting results were with the names of persons, and Zoberg achieved some rather mystifying approximations. Thus, when I was thinking of the actor Boris Karloff, he gave me the name of the actor Bela Lugosi. Upon my thinking of Gilbert K. Chesterton, he named Chesterton's close friend Hilaire Belloc. And my concentration on George Bernard Shaw brought forth a shout of Santa Claus. When I reiterated my charge of psychological trickery and besought him to teach me his method, 
He grew actually angry and did not speak for more than half an hour. Then he began to discuss our destination. A most amazing community, he pronounced. It is old. One of the oldest inland towns of all America. Wait until you see the houses, my friend. You can almost hear the ghosts within them, in broad daylight. And their devil's croft, that is worth seeing too. Their what? He shook his head as though in despair. And you set yourself up as an authority on occultism? He sniffed. Next you will admit that you have never heard of the Druids. A devil's croft, my dull young friend, used to be part of every English or Scots village. The good people would set aside a field for Satan so that he would not take their own lands. And this settlement has such a place? Jawa, a grove of the thickest timber ever seen as over-civilized country and hedged into boot. I do not say that they believe, but it is civic property and protected by special order from trespassers. I'd like to visit that grove, I said. I pray you, he cried, waving in protest. Do not make us unwelcome. We arrived shortly before noon. The little town rests in a circular hollow among high wooded hills, and there's not really a good road into it for two or three miles around. After listening to Zoberg, I had expected something grotesque or forbidding, but I was disappointed. The houses were sturdy and modest, and in some cases poor. The greater part of them made a close huddled mass, like a herd of cattle threatened by wolves, with here and there an isolated dwelling, like an adventuresome young fighting bull. The streets were narrow, crooked, and unpaved, and for once in this age I saw buggies and wagons outnumbering automobiles. The central square was a two-story town hall of red brick and hideous cast irons war memorial, still boasted numerous hitching rails, round with age and smooth with use. There were few real signs of modern progress. For instance, the drugstore was a shabby clapboard affair with pharmacy painted upon its windows, and it sold only drugs, soda, and tobacco, while the one hotel was low and rambling and bore the title Luther Inn. I heard that the population was 350, but I am inclined to think it was closer to 300. We drove up in front of the Luther Inn, and a group of roughly dressed men gazed at us with somewhat hostile interrogation that often marks a rural American community at the approach of strangers. These men wore mail-order coats of corduroy or suede. The air was growing nippier by the minute, and plowshoes and high lace boots under dungaree pants. All of them were of Celtic or Anglo-Saxon type. Hello, cried Zoberg jovially. I see you there, my friend, Mr. Gerd. How is your charming daughter? The man addressed took a step forward from the group on the porch. He was a raw-boned, grizzled native with pale, pouched eyes and was a trifle better dressed than the others in a rather ministerial coat of dark cloth and a wide black hat. He cleared his throat before replying. Hello, doctor. Susan's well, thanks. What do you want of us? It was a definite challenge that would repel or anger most men. But Zoberg was not to be denied. He scrambled out of the car and cordially shook the hand of the man he had called Mr. Gerd. Meanwhile, he spoke in a friendly fashion to one or two of the others. And here, he wound up, is a very good friend of mine, Mr. Talbot Wills. All eyes, and very unfriendly eyes they were as a whole, turned upon me. I got out slowly, and at Zoberg's insistence shook hands with Gerd. Finally, the grizzled man came with us to the car. I promised you once, he said glumly to Zoberg, that I would let you and Susan dig as deeply as you wanted to into this matter of spirits. I've often wished since that I hadn't, but my word was never broken yet. Come along with me. Susan is cooking dinner, and there'll be enough for all of us. He got into the car with us, and as we drove out of the square and towards his house, he conversed quietly with Zoberg and me. Yes, he answered one of my questions. The houses are old, as you can see. Some of them have stood since the Revolutionary War with England, and our town's ordinances have stood longer than that. You aren't the first to be impressed, Mr. Wills. Ten years ago, a certain millionaire came and said he wanted to endow us so that we would stay as we are. He had a lot to say about native color and historical value. We told him that we would stay as we are without having to take money from him, or from anybody else for that matter. Gerd's home was large but low, 
all one story and of darkly painted clapboards over heavy timbers the front door was hung on the most massive hand-wrought hinges gird knocked at it and a slender smallish girl opened to us she wore a woolen dress as dark as her father's coat with white at the neck and wrists her face under masses of thunder black hair looked oriental at first glance but with high cheekbones and eyes set aslant then i saw that her eyes were a bright gray like worn silver and her skin rosy with a firm chin and a generous mouth the features were representative celtic after all and i wondered for perhaps the fiftieth time in my life if there was some sort of blood link between scott and mongol her hand on the brass knob of the door showed as slender and white as some evening flower susan said gerd here's dr zoberg and this is his friend mr wills she smiled at zoberg then nodded to me respectfully and rather shyly my daughter gerd finished the introduction well dinner must be ready she led us inside the parlor was rather plainer than in most old-fashioned provincial houses but it was comfortable enough much of its furniture would have delighted antique dealers and one or two pieces would have impressed museum directors the dining room beyond had plate racks on the walls and a long table of dark wood with high backed chairs we had some fried ham biscuits coffee and stewed fruit that must have been home canned dr zoberg and gerd ate heartily talking of local trifles but susan gerd hardly touched her food i watching her with stealthy admiration forgot to take more than a few mouthsful after the repast she carried out the dishes and we men returned to the parlor gerd faced us you here for some more hocus pocus he hazarded gruffly for another seance amended zoberg suave as ever doctor said gerd i think this had better be the last time zoberg held out a hand in pleading protest but gerd thrust his own hands behind him and looked sternly stubborn it's not good for the girl he announced definitely but she is a great medium greater than eusapia paladino or daniel holmes zoberg argued earnestly she is an important figure in the psychic world lost and wasted here in this backwater please don't miscall our town interrupted gerd well doctor i agree to a final seance as you call it but i'm going to be present zoberg made a gesture as of refusal but i sided with gerd if this is to be my test i want another witness i told zoberg Ach, if it is a success you will say that he helped deceive not i i'll arrange things so there will be no deception both zoberg and gerd stared at me i wondered which of them was the more disdainful of my confidence then susan gerd joined us and for once i wanted to speak of other subjects than the occult it was zoberg who suggested that i take susan gerd for relaxing drive in my car i acclaimed the idea as a brilliant one and she thanking me quietly put on an archaic seeming cloak black and heavy we left her father and zoberg talking idly and drove slowly through the town she pointed out to me the devil's croft of which i had heard from the doctor and i saw it to be a grove of trees closely and almost rankly set it stood apart from the sparser timber on the hills and around it stretched bare fields their emptiness suggested that all the capacity for life had been drained away and poured into that central clump no road led near to it and i was obliged to content myself by idling the car at a distance while we gazed and she talked it's evergreen of course i said cedar and a little juniper only in the hedge around it susan gerd informed me it was planted by the town council about ten years ago i stared but surely there's greenness in the center too i argued perhaps they say that the leaves never fall even in january i gazed at what appeared to be a little fluff of white mist above it the wider but contrasts with the black clouds that lowered around the hilltops to my questions about the town council susan gerd told me some rather curious things about the government of the community there were five councilmen elected every year and no mayor each of the five presided at a meeting in turn among the ordinances enforced by the council was one providing for support of the single church i should think that such an ordinance could be set aside as illegal i observed i think it could she agreed but nobody has ever wished to try 
The minister of the church, she continued, was invariably a member of the council. No such provision appeared on the town records, nor was it even urged as a written law, but it had always been deferred to. The single peace officer of the town, she continued, was the duly elected constable. He was always commissioned as deputy sheriff by officials at the county seat, and his duties included census-taking, tax-collecting, and similar matters. The only other officer with the state commission was the justice, and her father, John Gerd, had held that post for the last six years. He's an attorney then, I suggested, but Susan Gerd shook her head. The only attorney in this place is a retired judge, Keith Purvisant, she informed me. He came from some other part of the world, and he appears in town about once a month, lives out yonder past the croft. As a matter of fact, an ordinary experience of law isn't enough for our peculiar little government. She spoke of her fellow townsmen as quiet, simple folk who were content, for the most part, to keep to themselves, and then, yielding to my earnest pleas, she told me something of herself. The Gerd family counted its descent from an original settler, though she was not exactly sure of when or how the settlement was made, and had borne a leading part in community affairs through more than two centuries. Her mother, who had died when Susan Gerd was seven, had been a stranger, an outlander was a local term for such, and I think it is used in Devonshire, which may throw light on the original founders of the community. Apparently this woman has showed some tendency towards psychic power, for she has several times prophesied coming events, or told neighbors where to find lost things. She was well loved for her labors in caring for the sick, and indeed she had died from a fever contracted when tending to victims of an epidemic. Dr. Zoberg had known her, Susan Gerd related. He came here several years after her death and seemed badly shaken when he heard what had happened. He and father became good friends, and he has been kind to me, too. I remember his saying the first time we met that I looked like mother and that it was apparent that I had inherited her spirit. She had grown up and spent three years at a teacher's college but left before graduation refusing a position at a school so that she could keep house for her lonely father. Still idiotically mannerless, I mentioned the possibility of her marrying some young man of the town. She laughed musically. Why? I stopped thinking of marriage when I was fourteen, she cried. Then, look, it's snowing. So it was, and I thought it time to start for her home. We finished the drive on the best of terms, and when we reached her home in mid-afternoon, we were using first names. Gerd, I found, had capitulated to Dr. Zoberg's genial insistence. From disliking the thought of a seance, he had come to savor the prospect of witnessing it. Zoberg had always excluded him before. Gerd had even picked up a metaphysical term or two from listening to the doctor, and with this he spiced his normally plain speech. This ectoplasm stuff sounds reasonable, he admitted. If there is any such thing, there could be ghosts, couldn't there? Zoberg twinkled and tilted his beard spike forward. You will find that Mr. Wills does not believe in ectoplasm. Nor do I believe that the production of ectoplasm would prove existence of a ghost, I added. What do you say, Miss Susan? She smiled and shook her dark head. To tell you the truth, I'm aware only dimly of what goes on during a seance. Most mediums say that, not as Zoberg sagely. As the sun set and the darkness came down, we prepared for the experiment. The dining room was chosen as the barest and quietest room in the house. First, I made a thorough examination, poking into corners, tapping walls, and handling furniture to the accompaniment of jovial taunts from Zoberg. Then, to his further amusement, I produced from my grip a big lump of sealing wax, and with this I sealed both the kitchen and parlor doors, stamping the wax with my signet ring. I also closed, latched, and sealed the windows on the sills of which little heaps of snow had begun to collect. "'You're kind of making sure, Mr. Will,' said Gerd, lighting a patent carbide lamp. "'That's because I take this business seriously,' I replied, and Zoberg clapped his hand in approval. "'Now,' I went on, "'off with your coats and vests, gentlemen.' Gerd and Zoberg complied and stood up in their shirt sleeves. I searched and felt them both all over. Gerd was a trifle bleak in manner, Zoberg gay and bright-faced. Neither had any concealed apparatus, I made sure. My next move was to set a chair against the parlor door, seal its leg to the floor, and instruct Gerd to sit in it. He did so, and I produced a pair of handcuffs 
from my bag and shackled his left wrist to the arm of the chair. Capital, cried Zoberg. Do not be so sour, Mr. Gerd. I would not trust handcuffs on Mr. Wills. He was once a magician and knows all the escape tricks. Your turn's coming, doctor, I assured him. Against the opposite wall and facing Gerd's chair, I set three more chairs, melting wax around their legs and stamping it. Then I dragged all other furniture far away, arranging it against the kitchen door. Finally, I asked Susan to take the central chair of the three, seated Zoberg at her left hand and myself at her right. Beside me on the floor, I set the carbide lamp. With your permission, I said, and produced more manacles. First, I fastened Susan's left ankle to Zoberg's right, then her left wrist to his right. Zoberg's left wrist I chained to his chair, leaving him entirely helpless. What thick wrists you have, I commented. I never knew they were so sinewy. You never chained them before, he grinned. With two more pairs of handcuffs, I shackled my own left wrist and ankle to Susan on the right. Now we are ready, I pronounced. You've treated us like bank robbers, muttered Gerd. No, no, do not blame Mr. Wills, Zoberg defended me again. He looked anxiously at Susan. Are you quite prepared, my dear? Her eyes met his for a long moment. Then she closed them and nodded. I, bound to her, felt a relaxation of her entire body. After a moment, she bowed her chin upon her breast. Let nobody talk, warned Zoberg softly. I think that this will be a successful venture. Wills, the light. With my free hand, I turned it out. All was intensely dark for a moment. Then, as my eyes adjusted themselves, the room seemed to lighten. I could see the deep gray rectangles of the windows, the snow at their bottoms, the blurred outline of the man in his chair across the floor from me, the form of Susan at my left hand. My ears, likewise sharpening, detected the girl's gentle breathing, as if she slept. Once or twice her right hand twitched, shaking my own arm in its manacle. It was as though she sought to attract my attention. Before and a little beyond her, something pale and cloudy was making itself visible. Even as I fixed my gaze upon it, I heard something that sounded like a gusty panting. It might have been a tired dog or other beast. The pallid mist was changing shape and substance, too, and growing darker. It shifted against the dim light from the windows, and I had a momentary impression of something erect but misshapen, misshapen in an animal way. Was that a head? And were those pointed ears or part of a headdress? I told myself determinedly that this was a clever illusion, successful despite my precautions. It moved and I heard a rattle upon the planks. Claws, or perhaps hobnails, did not gird, wear heavy boots, yet he was surely sitting in his chair. I saw something shift position at that point. The grotesque form had come before me, crouching or creeping. Despite my self-assurance that this was a trick, I could not govern the chill that swept over me. The thing had come to a close halt to me, was lifting itself as a hound that paws its master's knee. I was aware of an odor, strange and disagreeable, like the one from a great beast cage. Then the paws were upon my lap. Indeed, they were not paws. I felt them grip my legs with fingers and opposable thumbs, a sniffing muzzle thrust almost into my face, and upon its black snot a dim, wet gleam was manifest. Then Gerd, from his seat across the room, screamed hoarsely, That thing isn't my daughter! In the time it took him to rip out those five words, the huddled monster at my knees whirled back and away from me, reared for a trice like a deformed giant, and leaped across the intervening space upon him. I saw that Gerd had tried to rise, his chained wrist hampering him. Then his voice broke in the midst of what he was trying to say. He made a choking sound and the thing emitted a barking growl. Tearing loose from its wax fastenings, the chair fell upon its side. There was a struggle and a clatter and Gerd squealed like a rabbit in a trap. The attacker fell away from him toward us. It was all over before one might ask what it was about. Just when I got up I do not remember, but I was on my feet as the grappler separated. Without thinking of danger, and surely danger was there in the room, I might have rushed forward. But Susan Gerd, lying limp in her chair, hampered me in our mutual shackles. Standing where I was then, I pawed in my pocket for something I had not mentioned to her or to Zoberg, an electric torch. 
It fitted my, itself into my hand, a compact little cylinder, and I whipped it out with my finger on the switch. A cone of white light spurted across the room, making a pool about and upon the motionless form of Gerd. He lay crumpled on one side, his back toward us, and a smudge of black wetness was widening about his slack head and shoulders. With the beam, I swiftly quartered the room, probing it into every corner and shadowed nook. The creature that had attacked Gerd had utterly vanished. Susan Gerd now gave a soft moan, like a dreamer of dreadful things. I flashed my light her way. It flooded her face, and she quivered under the impact of the glare, but did not open her eyes. Beyond her I saw Zoberg, doubled forward in his bonds. He was staring blackly at the form of Gerd, his eyes protruding and his clenched teeth showing through his beard. Dr. Zoberg, I shouted at him, and his face jerked nervously toward me. It was fairly cross-hatched with tense lines and as white as fresh pipe clay. He tried to say something, but his voice would not command itself. Dropping the torch upon the floor, I next dug keys from my pocket and with trembling haste unlocked the irons from Susan Gerd's wrist and ankle on my side. Then stepping hurriedly to Zoberg, I made him sit up and freed him as speedily as possible. Finally, I returned, found my torch again, and stepped across to Gerd. My first glance at close quarters was enough. He was stone dead, with his throat torn brutally out. His cheeks, too, were ripped in parallel gashes, as though by the grasp of claws or nails. Radiant suddenly glowed behind me and Zoberg moved forward, holding up the carbide lamp. I found this beside your chair, he told me unsteadily. I found the match and lighted it. He looked down at Gerd, and his lips twitched as though he would be hysterical. Steady, doctor, I cautioned him sharply, and took the lamp from him. See what you can do for Gerd. He stooped slowly as though he had grown old. I stepped to one side, putting the lamp on the table. Zoberg spoke again. It is absolutely no use, Wills. We can do nothing. Gerd has been killed. I had turned my attention to the girl. She still sagged in her chair, breathing deeply and rhythmically as if an untroubled slumber. Susan, I called her. Susan! She did not stir, and Dr. Zoberg came back to where I had bent above her. Susan, he whispered penetratingly, wake up, child. Her eyes unveiled themselves slowly and looked up at us. What? She began drowsily. Prepare yourself, I cautioned her quickly. Something has happened to your father. She stared across at Gerd's body, and then she screamed. Tremulously and long, Zoberg caught her to his arms, and she swayed and shuddered against her supporting circle. From her own wrists, my irons still dangled, and they clanked as she wrung her hands in aimless distraction. Going to the dead man once more, I unchained him from the chair and turned him upon his back. Susan's black cloak lay upon one of the other chairs, and I picked it up and spread it above him. Then I went to each door in turn and to the windows. The seals are unbroken, I reported. There isn't a space through which even a mouse could slip in or out yet. I did it, wailed Susan suddenly. Oh my God, what dreadful thing came out of me to murder my father? I unfastened the parlor door and opened it. Almost at the same time, a loud knock sounded from the front of the house. Zoborg lifted his head, nodding to me across Susan's trembling shoulder. His arms were still clasped around her, and I could not help but notice that they seemed thin and ineffectual now. When I had chained them, I had wondered at their steely courting. Had this awful calamity drained them of strength? Go, he said hoarsely. See who it is. I went. Opening the front door, I came face to face with a tall, angular silhouette and a slouch hat with snow on the brim. Who are you? I jerked out, startled. O'Brien boomed back in organ deep bass. What's the fuss here? Well, I began, then hesitated. Stranger in town, ain't you? was the next question. I saw you when you stopped at the Luther Inn. I'm O'Brien, the constable. He strode across the door sill, peered about him in the dark, and then slouched into the lighted dining room. Following, I made him out as a stern, roughly dressed man of forty or so with a lean face, made strong by a salient chin and a scimitar nose. His light blue eyes studied the still form of John Gerd, and he stooped to draw away the cloak. Susan gave another agonized cry, and I heard Zoberg gasp as if deeply shocked. 
The constable, too, flinched and replaced the cloak more quickly than he had taken it up. Who done that? He barked at me. Again, I found it hard to answer. Constable O'Brien sniffed suspiciously at each of us in turn, took up the lamp and herded us into the parlor. There he made us take seats. I want to know everything about this business, he said harshly. You, he flung at me, you seem to be the closest to sensible. Give me the story and don't leave out a single bit of it. Thus commanded, I made shift to describe the seance and what had led up to it. I was an uneasy, as most innocent people are, when unexpectedly questioned by peace officers. O'Brien interrupted twice with a guttural, ha, huh, and once with a credulous whistle. And this killing happened in the dark? He asked when I had finished. Well, which of you dressed up like a devil and done it? Susan whimpered and bowed her head. Zoberg, outraged, sprang to his feet. It was a creature from another world, he protested angrily. None of us had a reason to kill Mr. Gerd. O'Brien emitted a sharp, equine laugh. Don't go to tell me any ghost stories, Dr. Zoberg. We folks have heard a lot about the hocus-pocus you've pulled off here from time to time. Looks like it might have been to cover up some kind of rough stuff. How could it be? demanded Zoberg. Look here, Constable, these handcuffs. He held out one pair of them. We were all confined with them, fastened to chairs that were sealed to the floor. Mr. Gerd was also chained and his chair made fast out of our reach. Go into the next room and look for yourself. Let me see them irons, grunted O'Brien, snatching them. He turned them over and over in his hands, snapped them shut, tugged and pressed and held out a hand for my keys. Unlocking the cuffs, he peered into the clamping mechanism. These are regulation bracelets, he pronounced. You were all chained up then? We were, replied Zoberg, and both Susan and I nodded. Into the constable's blue eyes came a sudden shrewd light. I guess you must have been at that. But did you stay that way? He whipped suddenly around, bending above my chair to fix his gaze upon me. How about you, Mr. Wills? Of course we stayed that way, I replied. Yeah? Look here, ain't you a professional magician? How did you know that, I asked. He grinned widely and without warmth. The whole town's been talking about you, Mr. Wills. A stranger can't be here all day without his whole record coming out. The grin vanished. You're a magician, all right, and you can get out of handcuffs. Ain't that so? Of course it's Zoe Zoberg answered for me. But why should that mean that my friend has killed Mr. Gerd? O'Brien wagged his head in triumph. That's what we'll find out later. Right now it adds up very simple. Gerd was killed in a room that was all sealed up. Three other folks was in there with him, all handcuffed to their chairs. Which of them got loose without the others catching on? He nodded brightly at me, as if in answer to his own question. Zoberg gave me a brief penetrating glance, then seemed to shrivel up in his own chair. He looked almost as exhausted as Susan. I, too, was feeling near to collapse. You want to own up, Mr. Wills? invited O'Brien. I certainly do not, I snapped at him. You've got the wrong man. I thought he made answer as though catching me in a damaging admission. That it was a devil, not a man, who killed Gerd. I shook my head. I don't know what killed him. Maybe you'll remember after a while. He turned toward the door. You come along with me. I'm going to lock you up. I rose with a sigh of resignation, but paused for a moment to address Zoberg. Get hold of yourself, I urged him. Get somebody in here to look after Miss Susan, and then clarify in your mind what happened. You can help me prove that it wasn't I. Zoberg nodded very wearily, but did not look up. Don't neither of you go into that room where the body is, O'Brien warned them. Mr. Wills, get your coat and hat. I did so, and we left the house. The snow was inches deep and still falling. O'Brien led me across the street and knocked on the door of a peaked roof house. A swarthy little man opened to us. There's been a murder, Jim, said O'Brien importantly. Oh, Red Gerds, you're deputized. Go and keep watch. Better take the missus along to keep after Susan. She's bad cut up about it. We left the new deputy in charge and walked down the street, then turned into the square. Two or three men standing in front of the pharmacy stared curiously, then whispered as we passed. Another figure paused to give me a searching glance. 
I was not too stunned to be irritated. Who are those, I asked the constable. Town fellows, he informed me. They're mighty interested to see what a killer looks like. How do they know about the case? I almost groaned. He achieved his short, hard laugh. Didn't I say that news travels fast in a town like this? Half the folks are talking about the killing this minute. You'll find you made a mistake, I assured him. If I have, I'll beg your pardon, handsome. Meanwhile, I'll do my duty. We were at the red brick town hall by now. At O'Brien's side, I mounted the granite steps and waited while he unlocked the big double door with a key the size of a can opener. We're kind of a small town, he observed half apologetically, but there's a cell upstairs for you. Take off your hat and overcoat. You're staying inside till further notice. The cell was an upper room of the town hall with a heavy wooden door and a single tiny window. The walls were of bare, unplastered brick, the floor of concrete and the ceiling of whitewashed planks. An oil lamp burned in a bracket. The only furniture was an iron bunk hinged to the wall just below the window, a wire-bound straight chair and an unpainted table. On top of this last stood a bowl and pitcher with playing cards scattered around them. Constable O'Brien locked me in and peered through a small grating in the door. He was all nose and eyes and wide lips like a sardonic punchinello. Look here, I addressed him suddenly for the first time controlling my frayed nerves. I want a lawyer. There ain't no lawyer in town, he boomed sourly. Isn't there a Judge Purvisant in the neighborhood, I asked, remembering something that Susan had told me. He don't practice law, Bryant grumbled, and his beak face lit out of sight. I turned to the table, idly gathered up the cards into a pack and shuffled them. To steady my still shaky fingers, I produced a few simple, sleight-of-hand effects, palming of aces, making a king rise to the top and springing the pack accordion-wise from one hand to the other. I sure hate to play poker with you, volunteered O'Brien, who had come again to gaze at me. I crossed to the grating and looked through at him. You've got the wrong man, I said once more. Even if I were guilty, you couldn't keep me from talking to a lawyer. Well, I'm doing it, ain't I? He taunted me. You wait until tomorrow, and we'll go to the county seat. The sheriff can do whatever he wants to about a lawyer for you. He ceased talking and listened. I heard the sound, too. A hoarse, dull murmur, as of a coal in a chute, or distant, lowering herd of troubled cattle. What's that? I asked him. O'Brien, better able to hear in the corridor, cocked his lean head for a moment. Then he cleared his throat. Sounds like a lot of people talking, out in the square, he replied. I wonder. He broke off quickly and walked away. The murmur was growing. I, pressing close to the grating to follow the constable with my eyes, saw that his shoulders were squared and his hanging fist doubled as though he were suddenly aware of a lurking danger. He reached the head of the stairs and clumped down out of my sight. I turned back to the cell, walked to the bunk, and stepping upon it, raised the window. To the outside of the wooden frame, two flat straps of iron had been securely bolted to act as bars. To these I clung as I peered out. I was looking from the rear of the hall toward the center of the square, with the war memorial and the far line of shops and houses seen dimly through a thick curtain of falling snow. Something dark moved closer to the wall beneath, and I heard a cry, as if of menace. I see his head in the window, bawled the voice, and more cries greeted the statement. A moment later, a heavy missile hit the wall close to the frame. I dropped back from the window and went once more to the grating of the door. Through it, I saw O'Brien coming back accompanied by several men. They came close and peered through at me. Let me out, I urge. That's a mob out there. O'Brien nodded dolefully. Nothing like this ever happened here before, he said, as if he were responsible for the town's whole history of violence. They act like they want to take the law into their own hands. A short, fat man spoke at his elbow. We're members of the town council, Mr. Wills. We heard that some of the citizens were getting ugly. We came here to look after you. We promised full protection. Amen, intoned a thinner specimen whom I guessed to be the preacher. There are only half a dozen of you, I pointed out. Is that enough to guard me from a violent mob? As if to lend significance to my question, from below and in front of the building came a great shout, compounded of many voices. Then a loud pounding echoed through the corridor like a bludgeon on stout panels. 
You locked the door, constable? asked the short man. Sure I did, nodded O'Brien. A perfect rain of buffets sounded from below, then a heavy impact upon the front door of the hall. I could hear the hinges creak. They're trying to break the door down, whispered one of the council. The short man turned resolutely on his heel. There's a window at the landing of the stairs, he said. Let's go and try to talk to them from that. The whole party followed him away, and I could hear their feet on the stairs, then the lifting of a heavy window sash. A loud and prolonged yelling came to my ears, as if the gathering outside had sighted and recognized a line of heads on the sills above them. Fellow citizens called the stout man's voice, but before he could go on, a chorus of cries and hoots drowned him out. I could hear more thumps and surging shoves at the creaking door. Escape I must. I whipped around and fairly ran to the bunk, mounting it a second time for a peep from my window. Nobody was visible below. Apparently, those I had seen previously had run to the front of the hall, there to hear the bellowings of the officials and take a hand in forcing the door. Once again, I dropped to the floor and began to tug at the fastenings of the bunk. It was an open oblong of metal, a stout frame of rod strung with springy wire netting. It could be folded upward against the wall and held with a catch, or dropped down with two lengths of chain to keep it horizontal. I dragged the mattress and blankets from it, then began a close examination of the chains. They were stoutly made, but the screw plates that held them to the brick wall might be loosened. Clutching one chain with both my hands, I tugged with all my might. A foot braced against the wall, a straining heave, and it came loose. At the same moment, an explosion echoed through the corridor at my back, and more shouts rang through the air. Either O'Brien or the mob had begun to shoot. Then a rending crash shook the building, and I heard one of the councilmen shouting, Another like that, and the door will be down. His words inspired additional speed within me. I took the loose end of the chain in my hand. Its links were of twisted iron, and the final one had been sawed through to admit the loop of the screw plate, then clamped tight again. But my frantic tugging had widened this narrow cut once more, and quickly I freed it from the dangling plate. Then folding the bunk against the wall, I drew the chain upward. It would just reach to the window. That open link would hook round one of the flat bars. The noise of breakage rang louder in the front of the building. Once more I heard the voice of the short councilman. I command you all to go home before Constable O'Brien fires on you again. We got guns too, came back a defiant shrink, and in proof of the statement came a rattle of shots. I heard an agonized moan in the voice of the minister. Are you hit? In the shoulder was O'Brien's deep, savage reply. My chain, fast to that bar, I pulled back and down on the edge of the bunk. It gave some leverage, but not enough. The bar was fastened too stolidly. Desperate, I clambered upon the iron framework. Gaining the sill, I moved sidewise, then turned and braced my back against the wall. With my feet against the edge of the bunk, I thrust it away with all the strength in both my legs. A creak and a ripping sound, and the bar pulled slowly out from its bolts. But a roar and thunder of feet told me that the throng outside had gained entrance to the hall at last. I heard at last futile flurry of protesting cries from the councilmen as the steps echoed with the charge of many heavy boots. I waited no longer, but swung myself to the sill and wiggled through the narrow space where the bar had once out. A lapel of my jacket tore against the frame, but I made it. Clinging by the other bar, I made out at my side a narrow band of perpendicular darkness against the wall and clutched at it. It was a tin drain pipe by the feel of it. An attack was being made upon the door of the cell. The wood splintered before torn to blows and I heard people pushing in. He's gone, yelled a rough voice in a moment later. Hey, look at the window. I had hold of the drain pipe and gave it my entire weight. Next instant, it had torn loose from its flimsy supports and bent sickeningly outward. Yet it did not let me down at once, acting rather as a slender sapling to the top of which an adventuresome boy had sprung. Still holding to it, I fell sprawling in the snow twenty feet beneath the window. I had quitted. Somebody shouted from above, and a gun smoke. Get him, screamed many voices. Get him, you down below. But I was up and running for my life. The snow-filled square seemed to whip away beneath my feet. 
Dodging around the war memorial, I came face to face with somebody in a bearskin coat. He shouted for me to halt in the reedy voice of an ungrown lad, and the fierce set face that shoved at me has surely never felt a razor. But I, who dared not be merciful even to so untried an enemy, struck with both fists even as I hurtled against him. He whimpered and dropped, and I, springing over his falling body, dashed on. A wind was rising, and it bore to me the howls of my pursuers from the direction of the hall. Two or three more guns went off, and one bullet wickered over my head. By then I had reached the far side of the square, hurried across the street and up an alley. The snow, still falling densely, served to baffle the men, who ran shouting in my wake. Two, nearly every one who had been on the streets had gone to the front of the hall, and except for the boy at the memorial, none offered to turn me back. I came out upon a street beyond the square, quiet and ill-lit. Along this way, I remembered, I could approach the Gird home, where my automobile was parked. Once at the wheel, I could drive to the county seat and demand protection from the sheriff. But as I came cautiously near the place and could see through the blizzard the outline of the car, I heard loud voices. A part of the mob had divined my intent and had branched off to meet me. I ran down a side street, but they had seen me. There he is, they shrieked at one another. Plug him! Bullets struck the wall of a house as I fled past it, and the owner, springing to the door with an angry protest, joined the chase a moment later. I was panting and staggering by now, and so were most of my pursuers. Only three or four lean young athletes were gaining and coming even close to my heels. With wretched determination, I maintained my pace, winning free of the close-set houses of the town, wriggling past the rails of a fence and striking off through the drifting snow of field. Hey, he's heading for the croft, someone was wheezing, not far behind. Let him go in, growled another runner. He'll wish he hadn't. Yet again, someone fired, and yet again the bullet went wide of me. Moving swiftly and half failed by the dark and the wind-tossed snowfall, I was a bad target that night. And lifting my head, I saw indeed the dense timber of the devil's croft and its top seeming to toss and fall like the black waves of a high-pent sea. It was an inspiration, helped by the shouts of the mob. Nobody went into that grove. Avoidance of it had become a community habit, almost a community instinct. Even if my enemies paused only temporarily, I could shelter well among the trunks, catch my breath, perhaps hide indefinitely, and surely Zoberg would be recovered, would back up my protest of innocence. With two words for it, the fantasy would not seem so ridiculous. All this I sorted over my mind as I ran towards the Devil's Croft. Another rail fence rose in my way. I feared for a moment that it would baffle me. So fast and far had I run, and so greatly drained away was my strength. Yet I scrambled over somehow, slipped and fell beyond, got up and ran crookedly on. The trees were close now, closer. Within a dozen yards, behind me, I heard oaths and warning exclamations. The pursuit was ceasing at last. I found myself against close-set evergreens that would be the hedge of which Susan Gerd had told me. Pushing between and through the interlaced branches, I hurried on for five or six steps. Cannon from a big tree trunk went sprawling, lifted myself for another brief run, and then, with my legs like strips of paper, dropped once more. I crept forward on hands and knees. Finally, I collapsed upon my face. The weight of all I had endured the seance, the horrible death of John Gerd, my arrest, my breaking from the cell and my wild run for life, overwhelmed me as I lay. Thus I must lie, I told myself hazily, until they came and caught me. I heard her fancy I heard movement nearby, then a trilling whistle, a signal. It sounded like the song of a little frog. Odd thought in this blizzard. I was thinking foolishly of frogs while I sprawled face down in the snow. But where was the snow? There was damp underneath, but it was warm damp like that of a riverside in July. In my nostrils was a smell of green life, the smell of parks and hot houses. My fist closed upon something, two handfuls of soft, crisp moss. I rose to my elbows. A white flower bobbed and swayed before my nose, shedding perfume upon me. Far away, as though in another world, I heard the rising of the wind that was beating the snow into great drifts. But that was outside the Devil's Croft.